Well, good afternoon. We're here now uh, uh, on our hundred, uh, on our 77th show in Practical Show Tech. Really glad to produce these uh, events for you. And we've got a terrific guest today. Uh, Gail DePoli is, a, is a, depending on the job she's doing, she's either a technical director or a technical manager. And we'll get her to explain what the difference is, if there is any. Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand it, You've got all the creative people, all of the directors, all of the producers, and that all funnels down through one person on the show, and that's the technical <laughs> director who then goes to all the cameras, PA, video, sound effects, pyro, dressing room, delivery, secret service, police, venue, everything. So she basically is an interpreter. Or the choke point. <laughs> exactly, or a choke point, exactly. Never the choke point. <laughs> never, never, never. But but when I'm on a job, I always that that's the person I go to besides the venue, the vendor I'm working for for all the information I need, and uh, uh, it it really usually is is the the best source of information. I've worked with Gail for oh I don't know 30 years, 40 years, something like that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of different shows, and it's been re a real pleasure, and we're really glad to have her here today. So. Uh, uh, Mac, you want to uh, talk about questions my, for a second? A little Q&A spiel. I think we have uh, a, a bunch of new people today, so it'd be good to do it. Oh, somebody, somebody maybe needs to learn. Questions are what drive this, so please ask questions. If you go to your go to webinar control panel, there will be a little pull down tab that says questions, and you can type your questions in there, and we will we will. Uh, get those questions answered um, as many as we can. Uh, if if we run out of time and we can't answer them all, at least hopefully we, we will have hit every topic. But please be specific in your question because it unlike, probably will not be answered at that moment. And five minutes later, it may be out of context. So please be clear so that uh, the context of your question is understandable when when we come to answer it. And the same thing if you have comments to make, please please me make them uh, in context as well. Don't just say, oh, I always do that. It's like, well, okay, fine. <laughs> what is it you always do? Uh, so yeah, but please ask questions. That uh, questions are what really drive these webinars uh, and and create the interaction that uh, makes them valuable valuable. So so, Gail, I think the the question on all of our minds is, how are you doing your job by staying at home here? You know, from coming to a complete halt, putting on the brakes, and not knowing what to do, and and just answering the phone, can't, getting cancellations. It went from that. You know, it's like looking at my calendar, going, okay, I guess I could paint the house because I've got nothing else to do. But it it started out slow with, are you available to do? fill in a show cue. Um, and it was actually to do transmission on the um, the first global citizen. And that went worldwide and all the networks covered it. And it was basically a babysitting transmission. Well, how do I do that at home? I found out I didn't have enough of the tools I needed, but we created um, quad splits at teleports and I was receiving them, you know, on Wowza links and whatever, just so I can check in feeds and keep up and i realized i locked myself in the house with a laptop and a couple of cell phones and it's like making it up from and, and so as we know just like we're on this webcast now everything is a zoom meeting everything is is a webex everything is a microsoft teams and no matter how small the job would be in the real world of us doing it making a few days worth of phone calls and making paperwork it is now super invasive your time is no longer your own because everybody knows, well, you're home, I could just call you now and we can just keep scheduling one Zoom after another. And it takes three times longer to get the slightest task done. And as you and I were speaking previously, it's like, you're not, you're not in the room where it's happening. You're not there, you're in, so it's very frustrating. You have to be extremely direct with what you need or want. And when you can't get it, you're just, now you're just making it up. So it's, it's, but what, what I am doing that has any comparison to what I've done before is I've, I'm still hiring some crew very minimally to do some shoots in the field. We've made some videos. 
a lot of it is transmission, a lot of it is private IP, we're using Nextologies, all online and you know, all coming to my laptop or HDMI to the big screen TV. And when I need to, because um, of the show that I would be doing, and I'll use an example, I worked with SpaceX when we launched the astronauts from the Falcon to go to the space station. And I was involved with discovery for that. And I needed a lot more stuff in the house. So instead of being at the corner of, you know, 32nd Street and 8th Avenue meeting SOS to pick up and drop off gear. Now I meet them on the front porch and we bring routers and fall over internet routers and big screen monitors. And we're using um, uh, comms over um, IP. And we basically have people in eight states doing a show. And by the grace of God, it's been working. <laughs> it's kept it's kept me a, a little bit busy. Uh, it's not as though I'm filling in all of the gaps. I'm thankful for whatever work comes our way. A lot of of it also has been editing um, shows for YouTube. A lot of the event work, and this is where it comes to the difference: is what does a technical director do? What does a technical manager do? And in my case, a lot of times I get the tech the title tech producer. Tech directors are usually an events associated as running all of the technical stuff with events, with the creative and you are the catch all. And on the TV show, the tech director usually equates to the person who's also switching the show, taking the direction from the director. And I used to do that, but it's been a hundred years since I was a TD at CBS doing live television shows. Like the, um, I used to do the evening news and I would do the NFL Today show. Uh, and now as a tech manager, you're managing all of the people on the technical crew. And uh, so one of the things that I would like to do a lot of would be charity events where people are paying money to come in and we're raising money for whatever charity. And those groups are very much hurting this year. They can't throw an event. So how are they raising any funds to keep their charity going? And the one thing we found out is that we can cull from all previous years and record some new content, edit them up, and offer that out to the web on YouTube, and people are donating, and and it's working, and it's working for the charity, and it works to keep us off the streets a bit. So, you know, that's... Uh, I bet it's impossible to find an editor nowadays. You can't find an editor. I thank God that I have a couple that I work with all the time that are available to me, but editors right now are gold. And they're busy. And there are some some companies that we work with, edit houses, that are still working COVID rules where their entire workflow is working from home and they're feeding into their servers and they're doing major productions that way. And they're they're just slammed, nonstop busy. Nonstop busy. Uh, first of all, Fred Demingoni. Domingoni. Said, Fred, hi Fred, how are you? Long hi. time. Exactly. Uh, Jim Box asks. Uh, if you're how you're finding new new paradigm working as a video uh, tech manager, uh, is it is it it sounds like you're really a producer. What's the difference between you and a producer? In some cases, not much, but it depends on who you're working with. When uh, when I'm working with certain teams, I'm give, given a little more of a leeway to have a producer hat on and throw in my two cents where it would normally be working out of my lane, but we work as a collaborative team. Um, in this case, producers are coming up with the idea of we want to fill in the blank. And then it's up to us on the tech side um, to find a way to do it. And I can honestly say it's not always coming out of my head. I know who I call and we, we always collaborate because my, my job is really just to collaborate with all of the key people. You know, the key to success is hiring people that are smarter than you. You know, if I need to go to comms and I have comms questions, the two gentlemen that are running this webinar are top notch. I'd go to them and get answers. Same in video, you know, you have the people that you go to. Um, and that's really it. So as far as, you know, being the, the source of all the video, it's the collaborative effort still. And, and the, the playing field has kind of been leveled a bit in this in this new marketplace have you i'm sure you have i don't in fact you told me about an event recently that uh 
sort of forgot you and went ahead with the project and came to you at the at in the middle of the project says oh do you have anything to participate yeah yeah i, I actually had one of those um yesterday with with a phone call that was probably on their books for weeks and it was a technical operations phone call um for an upcoming event and was, oh we think maybe you should be on this <laughs> like yeah i think maybe i should and there a lot of it is uh a lot of people think that the minute they pick up the phone to you, you're on the clock and they don't realize that they should at least put, you know, a thought in your head so you can have a plan when you start working and it helps them as well. So they call you at last minute and usually at the that time it's damage control. It's what do you have to change? What do you have yeah. to do to make, to get them what they really want? Well, because also in, also in this environment, there are a lot of um, people coming up with ideas that have not worked with us or in our broadcaster or in our event um, domains, but they're saying they can, and they're having some miserable failures. And so it's like, we have to make sure that they don't make us look bad. Yeah, yeah, What without naming any names, can mm -hmm. you describe an event that, that uh, you came into after it you should have, and and you somehow, fixed a serious problem they were about to to come up against? It's kind of hard to say without naming a name. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. Yeah, but there there are there are a few. You know, there there are a few and and a lot of it is from the newbies. And I and I do and in fact I stopped getting these particular calls because I'm never available. But people will call for a show to hire the technical manager the day before the show. Are you available tomorrow? We are going to be in studio X, Y, or Z for the next three days recording. And it's like, well, what do you need me for? You obviously plan something. Uh, am I there to, I'm not the maintenance guy. And I, I'm i too old to be the, um, you know, Band-Aid and the rubber band. It's like, yeah. you know, I, I have enough fixing my own errors, but digging somebody else out of a barrel was like, not my idea of fun, especially if, you really have no knowledge of the project and you just walk in cold. Um, there are some people that are very good at that, but you know, I, I, I'm looking at retiring you know, in the next like 15 months. So uh, no, I don't no, want to do that. No, 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 you're oh, just- I'm not totally fine. retiring, I'm just gonna slow down. You've done 10,000 uh, days of worth of work. Now you, now, <laughs> you get, now you get to do the work you really want to do. Uh, oh, this is true. You mentioned a few television gigs. Uh, David David Robrell, Robrell, Robell is asking. Um, he's a corporate event TD, and he uses uh -huh. vector works for his CAD work. Do you do any drawing on your event and use any drawing things, or is that left up? Yeah, no, no, we do. And vector work and vector works is is our go to right now. Absolutely, and there are there are jobs you do where it really has to be marked out in CAD. Uh, and and accurately, or otherwise, if you get, especially if you're in a, a confined space, you're just behind the eight ball when things, when you arrive with too much stuff and it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. So if you have a really good um, CAD person, that's part of the, the show, every department can drop in their department on it. You have the scenic, you have the lighting, you have the sound, I put on all the cameras and all the other placement. And then when you, we arrive, we know it it's there, it works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's typically what I'm. I get. I get a, a a drawing from from the show that has already got scenic and and everything linen. And I plop down all my comms positions, and Absolutely. that was that's the way I look at it. That I can yeah. claim space, you know, and organize it. It's better than getting on site and saying, "Oh, where am I going to be?" You know. No, I used to do that from a hundred years ago with Auto Sketch, just to make sure that the parking lots were, mac were marked out properly for all the vehicles we that we'd have to stuff it stuff in them especially if you were the famous one was behind the shrine auditorium everybody wanted to see the parking lot really clean and in the meantime you had 42 trailers to park in there for dressing rooms yeah yeah definitely so without, so without a cat without a cad program you're really kind of lost yeah um uh diana and i won't even make an effort to kessel schmidt maybe it's the last name mm -hmm. That getting called into the last minute to babysit something you didn't get to pre-pro is the worst. Wouldn't want to wish it on my worst enemy. Uh, and Mark Herring yeah, says, hello. She's got that right. Yeah, Mark Herring says, hello, I miss you. 
Oh, me too. Thank Mark. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, He's a great guy. I haven't seen Mark in a long time. We, we did corporate work together. Yeah, me too. Me yep. too. Yep. All I get to see him now is on Facebook with his I, kids. I get to see everybody's on Facebook. Exactly. exactly. You know? I mean, now, no. now in this in this day and age, and I really don't get to see anybody. I don't get to leave my property. But, uh, you know, I can't even say maybe once a week. It's been like once every other week I'll go for a ride in the car just to change the atmosphere. How, how is this industry going to change? I don't think we're going to get back to real, real shows this year. No, and no, no I, I don't think so either. Way. Not the way we were used to doing them. Yeah. Um, one of the changes, some of the changes I think are going to be permanent. And some of them may be for the better. Um, and if not, some of them will be more difficult. We're all going, you're never going to see the days we're in a TV mobile unit. And I don't know how many mobile unit people are are on here right now. I do see a couple that I know. Um, you're not going to see of stuffing 30 people into a mobile unit anymore. That's not going to happen. And you're not going to see every network channel executive that believes that they have to be in that control room behind the director and producer be there. Because for the most part, right now, companies aren't allowing them to travel. And we're not going to allow them the space in the truck. So we're yeah. either going to have to make alternate accommodations for them outside of the truck on property or via web links so they can participate from home or their sure, office sure. and the sanitation and and protocol that we're going through now and the devices that people are designing to work with this whether it be the uv light kits or motion sensor uv lights go on and off um i think that's here to stay and that's a that's a good thing i mean yeah, I think in, in general, it's a good thing. In the past, we've always been conscious of, mm -hmm. in the intercom world, of mm -hmm. cleaning off the headsets between mm -hmm. shows and stuff like that. And that had nothing to do with with uh, virus. It had to right. do with dirt. Dirt, uh, yeah. Uh, but I, I think it until there's a, a, a useful uh, vaccine available, I don't think we're going to go anywhere other than where we're going right now. No, and uh, a lot of it, too, is... I. I we're trying to figure out, like, we know the audience is going to be an issue and, you know, maybe we could start having some people back, maybe not, who's, you know, it's a risk, it's a matter of calculated risk, who's going to take that, how many people do you need to bring in, how far away they need to be from each other, or you just work without an audience. And talent is getting awful used to now just making um, contributions to shows on their own, with their own people from their own home studio or from a studio yep. that they go and have sanitized. So yep. whether they want to come back and play with 12 other artists on the same stage, um, how much time do we need between that? Um, can a steady cam camera guy, this is to quote Glenn Weiss, who said it in, in a, a webcast that I saw him on recently, are they going to want the steady cam guy up near them or not? Um, don't know. I mean, for the guys who are in an arena show that are out in the house and away from the stage, it probably won't change their mode of working. They're just not going to have audience to shoot. But the people that are on stage, the A2s that are on stage, um, do we need to now provide a separate set of mics for every act that are on that stage because they don't want to reuse them? They don't want to wait the time to sanitize them. That's it's going to. And how long that stays in place, and, we don't know. And does talent end up miking themselves? Here's your lob. Put it on. Well, that's just it. Do we have them sanitized and do we have their road crew deal with them because they pre-approved and pre-screened their people? Yeah. Where, where yeah. you know, that's where the lawyers come in. Where do the liabilities uh, start, stop and pick up? But, you know, the great experiment is happening right now in Orlando with the NBA. And we all have many, many friends that are locked into the, the medical bubble right now and will be there for several months yeah. during the entire yeah. NBA yeah. season. and. Yeah. They're going to be the um, the trailblazers for many aspects of our new normal um, sports without fans and how um, they're developing audience participation without people being in the room and having the, the um, sure players Disney, hear it. Disney will probably build a stadium with 60,000 uh, uh, Zoom screens. Right. In the audience. And there, there's have a show audience. talking about doing some of those Zoom audiences in blocks. So it looks like you have a crowd. And others exactly. are talking about putting, you know, like your family pod. If you're a family of four or a family of six, you can go because you're your own unit. And if we, 
you know, sh we could shoot you away from you wide enough and in 4K manipulate yeah. around a lot of a lot of the groups of people. And uh, you know, everyone is thinking. All the propellers are spinning. Yeah. How we could do it. Um Savvy Dunleavy asks, hi, Gail, what's the hi. interest? What is the interest in becoming a tech manager and the path you took to get there? I know you didn't start as a tech manager, but how do you get no. there? No, um, it was the long and winding road, as they say. I, I wound up starting my career at CBS in New York. And that was literally, I needed a job when I got out of school. Where do you start to find one? And um, I graduated from Northeastern in Boston. I figured, oh, I'll, I'll start down the bottom of the, the broadcast chain and look at some small radio station markets and went nowhere. And my friend Gary uh, and I, when we came home from school, said, okay, let's start at the top now and go down and see what happens. So we literally hit Sixth Avenue in New York to hit the three big networks because they were all next to each other, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And uh, CBS was the one that let us in the door. And so they had a, a policy of promotion from within. And because I had a background during college working part time for John Hancock, a life insurance doing microfilming, because uh, I'm so old that the old <laughs> John Hancock Tower did not want to move all of the paper with them to the new John Hancock Tower, which was under construction. So, microfilming death certificates actually got me a job at CBS microfilming in operations and engineering. Hmm. And from there, I mean, I, I went into a little bit of a financial background working for the controller of news to get myself into the broadcast center and out of BlackRock. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I really wanted to move into the tech area. There was no doubt. I, enough of this skirting around. And for the first time since the 50s, they were having a big hiring in the tech department. And they were hiring 26 technicians because in CBS, you were classified as a technician or a supervisor. And then your job description falls into there after you're a tech. And out of the 26, six of them had to be from within the company. And one had to be black and one had to be a woman. So, <laughs> and so I, I started and they actually created a little class for us to see how we could fit in. And because they didn't know what to do with the girl person, and I'm being blatantly honest, they did not know what to do. Um, they put me on a crew. And so they stuck me on 60 Minutes. And the utility on 60 Minutes doesn't have a heck of a lot to do, but it was the best television university that I could have possibly gone to because you had the best of everybody on that show. Um, I learned how to do video from sitting with Manny Kaufman in the control room every week. I learned those cameras inside and out. I learned about audio from Jack Katz, the audio guy. And then I learned how to switch and be a TD from Gil Miller, who was a technical director. So when the camera guys wound up being out on the show, they would promote me to be the camera guy. I would learn how to do camera. And eventually I wound up getting off of that crew and kind of grew into other jobs. From being camera, I became video. And then when they had the need, I became the technical director. But at the networks, the technical director then was also the switcher of the shows. And unless it was a humongous show, like a Super Bowl or an NFL playoff game, where you had two technical directors. You had the one who was switching in the truck and the one who was in the field doing pretty much what I do now, managing the crew, doing all of, yeah, making everything funneling through you. So that's how I got that far. And then from there bloomed it into, uh, after I left CBS, after a very, very long stay, um, I left there after 18 years and I went over to Viacom, which was uh, for the MTV Networks side. And I got into more of the live music and production. So that's why I could do a little bit of everything. People were surprised when I was working on the SpaceX launch. And they go, oh, you're Gail, you're launching rockets. And it's like, but I did all that in news when, when it was a steady diet in special events at news to go down to the Cape and, and uh, see the, any rocket go up, especially during the shuttle days. But, uh, and we did soap operas and plus the hard news and sports. So you had, had a little bit of everything under your belt. So going on the outside was kind of easy for me. I just had to learn more live music. So the key is microfilm. It was microfilm. Exactly. <laughs> microfilm. <laughs> so uh, 
Mark Herring has a real question. Um, yeah. Last time we worked together, we did a multi-city broadcast. That technology has evolved a lot since then. Mm -hmm. What are some of the new things you're utilizing for hub and spoke multi-city broadcast events? Follow up, any new experience utilizing remote personnel like a director calling the show with a multi-view? Well, I know that you're, you're yes. work doing your job with a multi-view in your apartment right now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And we do have that with the directors as well. Um, we will send out using um, either Nextologies or LTN gear on private IP uh, to go to directors. So the latency is very minimal and the comms, the same thing. And the director is calling the show from his house. And we've done that. I've done that about half a dozen times already. And That's it's worked weird. very well. And Recently. live, live, okay. live, yeah. live, 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 twice with the director at home. Hmm. And the director was Ron DeMarias, who was a big director, big name. And he was at his home in Florida and he was directing um, people in Burbank and up at Cape Canaveral for SpaceX. So we do that. And as far as the multi-city stuff, it depends really on what you're doing. Because since Mark and I used to work back in the um, Chase days, uh, he was work he was working for one banking organization in Chicago, and I used to work for the other in New York. And then when they merged, so Mark and I did a show together, and then it was Mark's client after that. Um, now a lot of that stuff can be web based, and private web based, and secure web based. So we don't need a lot of the other um, technologies. But for multi points, like when I deliver um, global citizen to all these countries and formats, we, we've done it uh, using multiple platforms. We we'll provide fiber and a standards conversion to, you know, all over, you know, the US, obviously, or people are on the switch, and we provide it to BT Tower. And then we put it on all of the regional satellites that are normally done, like. Asia Sat, you know, Intelsat, Eutelsat, and whatever domestic satellite we would be using to cover um, this hemisphere. And that's pretty much what we're doing. And we also have put pre-taped shows um, up on like media servers or any, any web-based product where we could uh, lock down a file and they could download the show and air it at their own will. But for live, there are, pl there are plenty of ways not to do that very easily. Yeah. Uh, Jason Glass, a, a friend of mine who is an RF coordinator. Um, I know Jason. Hi, Jason. Yeah. Gail, how much do you quiz your department heads about critical sub-department details, such as comms and RF under audio, sound effects or pyro under lighting, as you plan the show? Is your style more focused towards individual details rather than delegation, or do you just let companies you trust go with it all of the above okay. when i'm with the companies i trust i trust them to do their job when i hire people that do the same show with me over and over and over again we touch base with each other we check each other's paperwork they ask me what i need and want i tell them they show me what they've done i come back to them if i need some you know more calm here or there or who needs to talk to what um, production usually comes to me rather than going directly to the um, audio department or to the comms department. And as long as, like I said, like with a Jason, if I'm with people who I trust and they know how to do their job, I allow them to do their job and I won't micromanager, micromanage anybody under the department head. Um, if I'm in uncharted waters and, you know, when you go to some city and they say, you can't bring anybody with you, you do this. And then, unfortunately, I'm a micromanager. If I have to be, I can be a micromanager. But for the most part, on the big shows, you don't have to be. The big shows have enough brain trust where you just need your department heads to have a meeting. You get together. The directors and producers tell you what they want. And there's so much work to be done. Everybody just goes and puts their head down and goes and does it. Years ago, I, I uh, uh, likened our business to the movie. Um, uh, Groundhog Day, and <laughs> because every single show we go into, we do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. This mics, intercom, cameras, 
a little bit moving around and we all do the show and expect it to come out different every time mm -hmm. and hopefully it does but, but, yeah. but it really yeah, as long as the creative different. in front of the camera is different though the, the bones are pretty much the same yeah yeah so um in it what, what kind of assistance do you normally need on these shows what do you have a particular assistant model or or a person you always want to hire to work on the show or i wish i could yeah i wish i could uh you know when when i was you know working staff at places i i would have an assistant and that assistant was my mind reader as well there would always be things that could be almost unspoken and, and things would get done but now um, if the shows get ridiculously large and I know I'm going to, and they're scattered over a big space and they're live, live, I will bring in a transmission manager, you mm -hmm. know, just because if, if, especially if there's a lot of different web components to go around with, you know, it's better if somebody is focused on that because it, you, you can't possibly have a transmission problem and a problem in the arena and have the same problem person take care of both. It, it's not good for the client. So for so, those shows, yes, I will bring in a transmission manager. So transmission is not a usual position on shows like that, or is it? Is transmission, no, on a live, live show, there's always transmission, and you'll always have the guy in the satellite truck or or a telco guy, you know, at the, for the switch, hooking, hooking up into the, right. you know, our tell boxes. But having a manager assigned to it, is not oh, always the case. A manager as opposed to the actual technician. Yeah, the technician will be there, but having somebody else to manage it because a lot of these broadcasts now just don't go to one person. And when they have other uh, digital deliveries and stuff, it gets to be a little bit of a pain. And it it really isn't right that you put that on the vendor's neck that you've hired, their tech in the satellite truck to have to take the responsibility for things that are probably not out of his, their you know they're out of their control i mean they, uh, for an example when we do these worldwide broadcasts live there's always somebody who's having an issue and they try to make it that it's your issue and then when you go to say well the bbc sees us and hears us and nbc sees us and hears us and, and you know and you go around the world to all the majors and there's some little guy someplace i'm like i think you better go back to your racks and start checking your gear to make sure because you know, we, we check with five people that are known and trusted in our community, and if they're all got it, so it wouldn't be fair to stick that on some tech's neck. Yeah. I think I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It it's, it's just like troubleshooting. You have to figure out where to go yeah. to figure out why something isn't working. The same with running a show. If somebody complains it's not working, is it leaving okay here? Is it leaving transmission okay, et cetera? Right. Right, right. And transmission should be passive. So, um, you know, once you do, once you fax it into a certain point, then you've got to, you know, your first, your first problems will be in your fax out from your, your point of transmission, which is your truck to the, to the uplink truck and, and the, uh, the, the dish farm or whatever point you're using, whether it's satellites or fiber. After that, it should be passive. So if there are problems along the way, you know, you've got to work through them. And that's, that could be a big job just for one person to take care of for a couple of days while we're running around because a band came in with another bright idea last minute and you have to figure out how you're going to find two more cameras and do all this other stuff because there it's the biggest part of the job besides planning because if you plan it well when it comes down to execution there should be no problems but as we all know once you get on site it's not that there are problems people come and all of a sudden their eyes are opened up and it's usually on the creative side and they're getting ideas. And so no matter what game plan you come in with, you're always modifying the game plan. And that's where um, experience and, and practicality of making these changes on the fly, you know, helps. It helps. Uh, on, on any show you might do, is there one aspect of that show that you, sort of always expect to have a problem or be a little more taxing than any other part um yes and no in recent years in accepting 
digital files for play out from mobile units. No matter how much we pre-plan, depending on who we are receiving them from, we can almost anticipate us having a problem in getting the files and we need to transcode them or play yeah. them back baseband into an EVS because they're not transferring properly. And yeah. as a matter of fact, that's what we usually wind up doing. It's just like play it back through through one of our digital devices and play it in baseband so that we can control it. But um, that's gotten a lot better and it really depends. If it's coming from a proper edit house, we don't have issues. Um, if it's coming off of somebody's machine, you know, in the basement, you know, they're taking liberties without checking with people and you have to go through that. But for the most part, no, um, you don't, there's nothing that I would say that I'm braced for when I get on site at every show. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, we've, we've spent the time when we have it to do a proper survey of where we're going and what we're doing and have enough meetings. And when we get there, you know, it, there may be a time where we know we're going to have an issue when we get on site because there are still questions that are unanswered. And that's usually from uh, it's stage driven from talent or, you know, whatever. Maybe they haven't hired that last person yet, so you don't know what they're going to come to the table with. Or yeah, by stage people, you mean the talent, may, yeah. when they, the first time they're going to be there is when they're on their first rehearsal and, and they may not have com communicated all their needs. Right, exactly. I mean, if you're already starting to set up and there's still a, a vacant slot for a performance and then all of a sudden last minute they get the big get a big name and the big name usually comes along with a lot of big requests and those are the things you wind up you know making up last minute while you're on site to make happen uh diana again is asking about vector work she must have a thing about vector works i think okay uh, uh no actually she has a different question okay uh, do you use your own vector works to organize the teams um, I can if I need to. If I'm if I'm the lead um, on a show, you know, if the show is if the show is small enough, it all comes. To, I'm the lead on it all. But if the show is really big with a lot of big design and all, it's the designer's vector works that we're going off of, and I don't pretend to even touch that. No. How how much of your of your tech spec uh, that you pr produce before the show gets going? is actually just a cut and paste of another show. Um, if, they're, if they're what I call the wash, rinse and repeat shows, and I do have some big ones that were on my calendar until this year, they are pretty much the cut and paste. Yeah, there yeah. are some show models, um, and I try to keep one from each, you know, I'll use an iHeartRadio festival for an example. Um, right. Anything that would fall in that sort of festival domain, that spec works nicely. So I'll take that and dust it off and model it to the current show. I have small studio show productions. I mean, you know, there's different I.O. panels. You handle things differently, whether you're in a four-wall studio or you've got a preset regular television studio or whether you're in an arena or if you're outside in the open. And if I use each of those type of shows as a base, then yes, it's I start with that base and then go from there because you're usually dealing with about the same amount of people the same amount of calm you just might want to change the numbers a little bit change the names to protect the innocent exactly yep yep um we we haven't been getting very many questions if anybody has a question i know there's uh 59 of you watching either that or you're just pretending you're logged on or you're or, or oh, you're i know i know a couple of those people there i can ask them questions too you know i'm looking yeah, well, forward to answering a couple I think you can just go through the the list there and start telling us things about these people. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll wait for a question or two. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, what 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 do you actually include at a very minimum and maximum in a tech spec? The min the minimum. What, so that when so that when we're really rushed and and you do it on the back of a napkin and it's like Stonehenge from from Spinal Tap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the bare minimum is the camera plot that you get from the director and the names of the camera people that are on it um, and your audio inputs to your audio guy. That is the bare bones. You know, give your tape guy his specs. You're going to be recording uh, this camera, that camera, and the other. 
and your playout channels are going to be X and Y, and you don't have a keyable, um, uh, tell the audio guy he's got, you know, four host mics and a spare here and there, a couple of IFBs, and that's the bare bones. But you usually, you can go with a map and, you know, peg down where people sit, where they're going to be. Right, right. That's it. The detail after that, then then you can really go into the minutia. And you need you need a book, and I've published a book. There are a couple of people in here that know they've seen my book. Um, when you're on a big show with a lot of people, and if you could give them the book even a day in advance, it helps. It's less questions on site once you arrive. For the guys who are strictly just text and come in and, okay, where am I going? What am I doing? Each department has their book, and then they only come back when I've made the mistake or I've missed a spot or they have a question about why I'm doing something a certain way. Typically, it, uh, Jason Glass wants to know on your show is, is um, uh, when things are going sideways, what's your procedure to deal with it? Um, the first thing is, is I go to the producers and I hold them off at bay. And then I go to the technicians to find out, it depends on where it's, it, why it's going sideways. And I don't always like to blame that it's on the tech side, but I'm gonna assume that that's where the question's coming from. If the, if the tech side all of a sudden is going sideways for whatever reason, and I just try to get to the root of the problem there, find out what we need, why it's going wrong, maybe we need to bring in something else, or if we just need to do a stop down for 15, 20 minutes to get the problem fixed. Yeah. But I try, I try to, um, keep the screaming at bay and keep production from breathing down people's necks because uh, if if you're breathing down somebody's neck, they're not gonna be as productive as if you take two steps backwards and give them the five, 10 minutes they need to fix it. And that's just that's just my work style. So basically it, the department that's having a problem, you tried to give them the, the, the flexibility to fix it without the producer cutting their heads off. Exactly. Exactly. I kind of, I kind of put myself in as the buffer, and if there's the head that gets cut off, it will be me because I'll be the more vocal one. But it'll be like, he needs X amount of time. Let's give him a break. Why don't you go have a coffee, and then we'll come back. And you know, and if it's a deeper problem than that, you know, I, I will also find out what the problem is, and not throw anybody under the bus, but solve solve the issue so that everybody's happy. And if a compromise needs to be made because we can't deliver what was expected but we have a solution around the problem so the end goal may be the same it's just the means may be different i'll be the deliverer of the bad news or the good well, news obviously a live show is different than a tape show absolutely a tape show you can live with redoing something right right on a, on a live show you, you need to be able to be flexible enough where if you don't have something first place you have a backup system um and on alternate means of of doing a task. How, how how much do you work with stage managers? Do stage managers work for you, or do they work for the director? Wow. They or work for the director? They're all uh, on a director's guild show. They're all part of the 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 DGA team. Um, and on a smaller shows, the stage managers usually communicate through me or the director or both. You know, they'll talk to the director. They'll come to me and tell me their needs. And depending on the show, depends on what their needs are. On the bigger shows, because you can't be every place at once, it, if they communicate with me in advance or I'll reach out to them in advance, like, what do you need on the stage? We put that in the plan and it goes. Otherwise, right. when the stage manager gets on site, he'll see the first familiar, he or she, he'll see the first familiar face that they know, whether it be the head utility, to get the right video feeds that they want for a monitor, whether they want a router, whether they want a multi-viewer, he'll grab the, the the lead comms guy that he knows and and he'll say, uh, instead of having, you know, now it's a little more versatile, they don't have to ask for a panel because of the new Riedel packs and everything else, guys can have six channels on their belt pack, so they're not looking for as many panels in place, but they will know who to go to, who the, who the key person is on the floor. And if it wasn't already in the plan, then usually that person will tell me later, oh, I added such and such for so and so. But largely people, uh, obviously, at least in my my world, know to go to the tech manager to find out how to get something done. 
Absolutely, because a, a lot of times too, there may be a cost implication involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, you will have in your rack of tricks and in your workbox extras of everything, but you can't pull them all out and give them away because first place, I may come to you and need something and you've already given, given away all the extras without me knowing about it. Right. Or number two, you can't just give them away to me without renting them back. There's only so much play right. in that. I have extra right. in the kit. So all of that really should be communicated through me. And then we, then we try to at least speak with one voice. Um, There's, we've got a couple of requests for some war stories, but before we get to that, uh, <laughs> just pick uh, the war. Just pick exactly, the war. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Mark Kennedy wants to know how do you plan for facilities now? Crew people spread everywhere now, all with different connectivity. Or how do you, in in this world, in the COVID world, how do you make the the everybody connect? Well, it it hasn't changed that much for me really, as far as the methodology to it, still trying to find the best person for the job as close to the job as possible. Um, and I'll use the example of when we did the SpaceX launch. Because yeah. I needed people in Burbank, I'm calling for certain positions, call them in Burbank. I also needed to have people at the Cape. So I go to my Florida Rolodex because I did not want anybody to go on an airplane. And that was my, that was my call. I mean, I did have, one person who could have driven but preferred to fly. And I said, I'm just putting it on the record that I'm not asking you to do that. This is your preferred mode of travel. And and that was good. Um, so I, I'm sort of handling it that way. And that's really the only concession to crewing that I would make now. And, and I'm also doing another show in Miami, um, at least allegedly, uh, at the end of next month. And I'll be calling, you know, the Miami or the, you know, Florida in general people for that show and seeing if they're available. And right. I'm already expecting that a lot of them won't be because they've probably been locked up in the NBA bubble in Orlando. Yeah, yeah. You know? Lori Doyle comments on that same thing we're talking about here. Even though the stage managers are work for the director, you often get in the middle of hiring them for, for the event. Right. Sometimes, sometimes I'm asked. Yeah. Sometimes I'm asked, who do you know, uh, you know, here, do you have, do you have any good stage managers here? I'm, I'm always asked um, by, by a lot of departments because I travel around so much. Sure. Sure. And of which I'm not doing now, if there's a big change in life, I, you know, you know, I'll talk about a war story. I came home. My last broadcast was in Nicaragua. It was the Nick Walenda wire walk over the Mas Masaya volcano. And um, that, you know, we came off of a real high of working on uh, what could have been a really treacherous show. It worked like, it went like clockwork. It was everything that was on paper happened when it was supposed to happen. It, we had a great team. It was a big success. And I walked off the plane and walked into my house and the phone just didn't stop ringing with cancellations. Mm. And, oh it was, and that was it. And then we had to wait forever to get our gear back. I mean, it loaded up on time. You know, the, the tanker got loaded up on time and it got back to the port, Port Everglades in Florida on time. But by then things were locking down and the ports were working with like one third of people and it took forever to get gear back and papa you know and uh you know that was talking about a war story there and that, that's a gift that keeps on giving it's still it still keeps going on you know it's like but we finally got everybody's gear back to them you know and that was just a major uh it was like a troop movement when you realize that we we sent 27 um cargo containers to nicaragua to pull that show off for, for lighting, audio, video, and Nick's rigging. And when it came down to it, I would say a good 75% of my gear was going to be coming from the Super Bowl. So even though originally we had planned to um, freight everything out of the port of Houston, because it was a nice easy float to Nicaragua from there, it wound up having to come out of Port Everglades in Florida because when 75% of your gear it's coming from the Super Bowl. So as, as people were packing up equipment, um, 
from the Super Bowl and, and they were going back to a warehouse. We took over a corner of the warehouse and everything going to Nicaragua went into that corner. Did you pick up anything local in Nicaragua? No, there wasn't really anything to pick up. The only thing, the only uh, other, other than some good, good, solid labor, good people, really smart, smart PAs and manual labor, kids that worked with every department. We, we, we were picking up 20 laborers and we really only got 10 once we got down there. So we shared them between the staging and rigging department, lighting department and tech. And I split them between you know, audio and video. And these guys were, couldn't do enough to help us. And, and they're poorer than poor and rich of heart. And we couldn't do enough for them too. I mean, we, I had all of our fiber run before my tech crew came. You know, we just labeled up the ends. And I said, the guys put this here, put that there. And they were fine. They had the translator with them and it all worked well. And within the first day of them working with uh, the American technicians and all, the techs all got together and said, we have to pool our money together and give these guys more money. We have to make sure we pay them. I said, please do. And they couldn't have been more appreciative. We waited until the last box was packed and we're ready to go. And they, they each got uh, some nice cash from the crew, we divvied it up and all the departments chipped in. And I mean, they were on their near knees and crying and praying. They were so happy that they got them because it's such a dirt poor country. And the last thing that happened was our stage hands, our hardcore, you know, local one out of New York, local 33 out of LA stage hands took off their pretty much new work boots, all of their Timberlands, whatever steel toe shoes and left them behind for those guys just so they could have them. And it was like, it was just the warmest feeling and it was such camaraderie. And then we come back and it's like, bam, we get hit in the face with this. And, and now I've been in touch with some people there. They're getting hit worse than we are. I mean, it's just really bad. Really yeah. Bad. Yeah. Bad. That, there, there's no, no, I probably would imagine there's no financial support of the people in the country at all. No, and no, no information. They're literally literally dying in the streets. People have sent me videos where they're just picking people off the streets. Um, and, and, and there's no resources. And, and all of the other countries in Central America have pretty much locked them down. They're just can't cross the border to do anything. It, it's, it's horrible. It's a horrible yeah. situation. But the people there were some of the most wonderful that we had to work with. But there wasn't any gear we could use. I mean, we, we tried. We, re we really did just to be in good faith, say, could I rent a camera package from you? It, it just, they had nothing. We brought, we brought in generators. We brought, we brought in Musco trucks. It was, it was crazy. Well, I would imagine there's there, you, you, not much time to advance it where you could find this anything down there. So you might just bring everything in. Well, we, we did, we really did try. I mean, uh, I, I had a good six months of, you know, Let's try to make phone calls. I was lucky I was able to find fuel. And once I did find fuel for those generators, it was a good deal. Um, yeah, but we had to have feelers out to all of the people that we could get fuel from down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we finally got a, a good company who understood what we wanted and needed as opposed to charging me to fill up every generator to the top every day we were there. And when I really didn't need that. They just wanted me to advance, buy it with no rebate at the end. And I'm like, no, that's not going to work. I'll pay for the full tanker as you come up and fill. And at the end, if there's anything left in the tanker, it's yours. But I'm not going to pay for doing the mathematics of having 14 generators and not knowing what I was going to burn every day. And, uh, you know, so it, it was a very interesting project. We learned a lot about a lot of different things. And, uh, and and it was a lot of fun as well. It was a lot of fun. Um, avoiding the financial factor, what's the com? What your com preferences for a show? If you had what you really wanted, in a in a live situation, any any, uh, any type. Uh, you know, I, I have gotten so used to the readles now, um, mm -hmm. and very happy with all of the technology and with the wireless and, and having the multi-channel versatility that they have. Yeah. Because I used to actually avoid trying to strap onto a belt pack and having only two channels on it. Cause I'm like, I'm limited. So I have to stay in the truck near a panel. Well, I don't have to do that anymore. I can now roam around and stay in touch. Yeah. And also now with some of the virtual comms, 
uh, I, if we're on a VCOM, I can have it on my iPad and roam around and have my full panel under my arm. Exactly. Which, which is what I do in the house when I'm doing a show. You wander around. If I have to, if I have to get to one end because doing something, and rather than leaving it up full blast, I just put it in the earpiece and I have the, the iPad with me. Exactly. Um, uh, Kevin Westerman wants to know, we're, as we're talking about software you're using, what tools, apps, etc., do you like to have with you when you're managing an event? I mean, anything special be beyond the obvious, like a, an Excel spreadsheet? Excel, I was just gonna say Excel. I have to have Excel, no matter what. Yeah. Um, I'm allergic to Google Docs. I will say that on this really? group. That's Google my favorite. Doc, that's your favorite? Yeah. Google Docs is a nice toy. It's a good tool. And it could tank a live show if you don't use it properly. Yeah, I you can know? imagine. I can yeah. imagine. I mean, we I like really it. have to manage it. It, it is good. You know, you Google know. Drive is good to share stuff fast. It's, it is. I will not say anything bad that way. But on a live show, if people don't manage it right, just like with a Dropbox, you could sink a ship. Yeah, yeah. And I don't, I, and I don't like to always put stuff in a Dropbox, and then if you ask somebody a question, and they'll say, "Well, it's in the Dropbox," and it's like I'm not staring at it 24 hours a day, and they're doing other tasks. So if you have a major change, just don't put it in Dropbox. Send out an email blast and say, "Check version 85." You know. Got it. Got it. Uh, Jenny Montgomery is asking, um, uh, I love your depth of knowledge and the story of your path. If you look into your crystal ball, where do you see new baby tech managers coming from? Is it a position that is even addressed in schools? For example, when I was in University of Risky Theater, I wasn't aware that being an A2 was a thing. Certainly not doing RF. Now, yeah. I have students say to me that this is what they want to do when they get out of school. Wow. Well, that's, that's interesting. Um, the road to tech manager, I don't think is any, to come from my ranks the way I did, um, will only happen at network level now. I, I don't think it'll come from the freelance level. Uh, there, there. You could make, you could still make a really good buck to a really late age if you're sitting down at a switcher and keep up with the technology. So it's a, like you're taking on a big responsibility to do the cutting of the show with the director. Why would you want to take on this other stuff too? Old yeah. timers do both. Um, the young people don't have to. People can come in without, and have been coming in without the hands-on background mostly because they're coming from the digital side of technology. Mm -hmm. And those that are staying ahead of all of the digital apps and digital uh, transport of video. Uh, but there's still, you know, there's still some chances. Um, people out of engineering school um, could handle this. A good department manager in any, place in any in any workforce it doesn't have to just be broadcast if you are a good department manager you could learn how to manage a department in broadcasting you know and then you le you learn the more you learn the bigger the bigger your department skills can grow but uh, I, I see that most of the new people are coming in now are coming from the, the digital side I uh, uh, one of the partners in practical show tech is Bruce Kramer and he started out as a lighting designer in college. And then he came to work for me at Theater Technology and learned sound. And he, uh, over the years, has worked in several other departments, uh, TV and live and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, recorded events. And once he has all these different technologies under his belt, he then took on the job of a tech manager and went out and tech managed a huge, huge car show that traveled all over the country. And he had to deal with uh, filling a difficult job. dirt to make the, the Jeeps fly over the dirt and stuff like that. And yeah. if you know all the departments, that's your path to becoming a tech yeah. manager, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, and the, light, the lighting departments now are almost superseding the technical areas because of the intricacies of all of their new equipment. You know, they, 
Yeah, very, very complicated. Very complicated. You know, they used to put in hardware and go up and focus lights, and then it started with wiggle lights so you could move them electronically. But now with all of the server-based items and all of the protocol that they have and pre-vis that they could be building outside of the room, um, their electronics are as sophisticated and beyond what ours are. You know, it's like the old days at front of house at a big show, big live music event mm -hmm. uh, in an arena, say. 90% of front of house was the audio consoles and a tiny little portion was a little little um, uh, console for lighting. And now yeah. it's the other way around. Audio yeah. has gotten very compact out at front of house and, and the um, lighting department, which encompasses the video servers and LED walls, takes over everything else. Yeah. So they're, and and it's such a such an intricate part of the broadcast now. Yeah, definitely. Uh, any other uh, 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 great stories from let's say thirty years ago you can tell us about? Oh, I don't know. Pick 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 a genre. Um, film. So, 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 now you know what, the only thing I do with film is roll triples into the Cronkite show. And oh, okay. Most okay. On, most of the people on here, you know don't know we, we, what a Telecini does, you know, let alone we had these multiplexers that were 35 millimeters, 16 millimeters, some had an eight and they had slide machines. And then the, um, the telops, the old telop machines, I used to put those on the air. But is some of the crazy things, one was uh, the 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty. And I was the, uh, the honcho TD. So not the tech manager, but at the time it was, you know, two TDs, one switch, one honcho. So I actually switched, but also honchoed the CBS setup on Governor's Island. And we were out there for three weeks building this monster setup. And, you know, uh, the Walper Productions had this big stage. Ronnie Reagan was president and big entertainment show. And we were doing the op sale news. It took us three weeks to get out there, going back and forth on the little Governor's Island ferry. And it was like, Besides that it was crazy, besides that it was hot, we built $2 million glass greenhouses on the top of a 13-story apartment building on Governor's Island at the time, which has all been leveled now, and it's a city park. It's lovely. Um, one was for the network news with Dan Rather, and the other one was for uh, WCBS in New York, the local news with that was, uh, at the time, Jim Jensen and Rollin Smith. And so we're doing all of our shows, and this had nothing to do with technical, but it was logistics so now you spend all these weeks bringing all this stuff in and bringing all these people in and you have a big audience how do you get them out of there now all at the same time they couldn't they had a commandeer staten island ferries and it broke the dock at the governor's island pier it took us forever to get out of there i wound up god rest her soul she recently passed away this past year michelle marsh i wound up getting across to the other side with michelle marsh and now we have no way to get uptown but these firemen had come by with their truck and they re recognized Michelle. Hey, how are you? You know, what can we do? And she goes, hey, can we hitch a ride? And we just jumped on the fire truck and went uptown <laughs> so we can get to the first open subway station. But, you know, th there are some things that that we do in our business. I mean, that that has nothing to do with the business and their experiences that you have that you, you couldn't make them up. You couldn't write the script. Yeah. You know, they're just so much fun. We I did a show um, year before last at the Vatican for the Pope in Rome. Well, yeah, the old Catholic girl from Catholic school thought she died and gone to heaven right there. And it was just, it was just such, such a special experience. And that was after uh, working with three different popes on three different masses in New York. Uh, one while I was as CBS and, the, and uh, with Pope John Paul II, we were doing pool down at Battery Park. Um, the other, um, with Pope Benedict at Yankee Stadium. And uh, the the next that, that I was one of the producers on was the Papal Mass at Madison Square Garden with Pope mm -hmm. Francis. And, you know, the, just great experiences you, you'd never expect to have in your lifetime. No, I know where you're at. I mean, particularly getting out of a show at the end of the show when you're having to deal with all the audience around you at the same time is, is always oh. a problem. It's very special, you know. Yeah. You know, are you getting, or you get blocked in by the garbage trucks, or you, you know, you can't, you can't get out. And you know, you've got, you've got the financial producers on. You're trying to get out and get people off the clock, and it's like, and you're trying to keep people safe. <laughs> you're, you're just 
you're just blocked, you know, you're doing, doing a show and, and Mark knows this as well as the rest, doing shows in hotel ballrooms. You know, it's great. You can finally get in there. You're sharing the same service elevator that everybody else in the hotel uses. And one unnamed hotel in Times Square, we all know which one it is. Um, we do a lot of shows in their ballroom. And when the show is over, you're there with the laundry truck. And that laundry truck is not leaving that slip in the dock. And you could be there for another five hours. Yeah. It's like yeah. You, you could try slipping the driver a hundred dollar bill and say, like, you just pull out for a half an hour. Nope. You know, and it's like, and you just walk away. It's like, what can you do? You could get totally annoyed or laugh. And I can't say that I don't get totally annoyed because I've, I'm known to pop my cork on occasion, but it's like their best laid plan and you'll get screwed up by the laundry truck. Every uh, time in New York. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, Mac. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I've been here all along. I just, uh, I, I didn't think you needed to look at my mug. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, when you're when you're working on a show and you get called to do a show and they said, oh, we're going to be in Tanganyika. Do you think I've never been there? I'm in a vacation. I'm going to love I'm going to travel around. Is that ever come up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I oh, you know, and I used to try to I can't do it as much as anymore because I just don't I don't have uh, the uh, ability to tack on not because of work because of personal reasons to just stay out of the country longer than necessary but i always look at it as oh i'm going to tack on a few days and do this and that and yes i have done that i did that um on a trip to australia once for showtime we went to and i would always wanted to go to australia never had been and we went for a survey and i didn't know if, I'd ever, if the show was even going to happen we had no idea and i packed as much into that survey for downtime. I didn't sleep. Other people went to bed, I went sightseeing. You know, it was crazy. And then when we did go back to do the show, I took my vacation. And I stayed three weeks and just ran around the country and just enjoyed every bit of it. And and I had that in um, uh, for a lot of shows. I did a, a Hyundai commercial for the Super Bowl in Zagan, Poland at a NATO base. Uh, I think it was three years ago. Whenever, whenever the Super Bowl was in Houston. And the people we were working with had no idea what we were doing. They thought we were giving a Super Bowl party to 500 tank troops in the U.S. And it was it was a great experience, let, let alone being with all of these guys from Colorado with their tanks. And they're letting us get in the Bradleys and go boom, boom out in the field with them. But uh, it, the NATO base itself was, because that part of Poland, it was Zagan Poland, was part of Germany during World War II, and these were the German Stalags. And this was Stal Stalag 8, the great escape Stalag. So it was like, we, there were only three of us from the US that went, the rest of my crew was from Germany. And we were like little kids and had to run to Tunnel Charlie faster than the speed of light because we didn't know if we were gonna have any time. I'm like, while we're here now, and it was like deep snow and ice, and so we've, we've gotta go there. And and then I took a couple of days, because I hadn't, I hadn't been, back to Berlin since the wall had come down. And so it was a long time. And so I took a couple of days to wander around uh, Berlin and, and especially East Berlin. And it was, there's a special, you, you know, you, you try you try to make the most of it. Definitely mm -hmm. try to make the most of it. These are these are golden opportunities that we have in our business. Yep. You know, yep. and even yep. and it doesn't have to be foreign travel. I mean, even in the US, you know, you get to go to a place you haven't seen before, you go, you go roaming around. Yep, I always uh, travel with my at least my my scuba goggles, which are prescription prescription, and my my dive log, and I can rent the equipment wherever I am. And I've been diving all around the world because I just finish a job in Beijing and I go off to uh, to uh, some country in the South Pacific and uh, go diving. It's 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 a great opportunity. Once you're there, that's ninety percent of the work. That's ninety percent of the work. You're already there, and so you just you make the best of it, and it and, it, and it's great. I, I when I did some corporate jobs, I used to do a lot of IBM jobs back in the day, and we'd go to Japan often, and I'd always make sure I'd I'd stay four days to a week after every one of those jobs and get another person in Japan and have a blast. Yeah, have a blast. it's like they've already paid for the plane ticket, so I could pick up the room for a few days. Yeah, sure. <laughs> like the, sure. the heavy lifting's done. 
Sure. Uh, David Robel says, thanks for the seminar. Miss you. Ah, uh, miss you too. Miss you too. Yeah. So this has been really, really interesting. And I think that uh, we've sort of, sort of demystified what you do, but nobody will ever actually know for sure. Follow me around. I could use the help. I, can, exactly. I do look for helpers. So if there's anybody on here that, that wants to learn, because really in, in the next year and a half, I, I'm not going to put on the brakes, but yeah. I, I'm starting to push stuff off. And, and, and I, I'm, I look forward to making sure that some of my clients are well taken care of and have other people that are, can be enthusiastic and, and will take care of their needs. Well, good. Good, right. definitely. You know, that's anyway, a very- thank you, for, thank you for inviting me. Hopefully I wasn't too boring. No, not at all. Not at all. I kn knew you weren't going to be boring even when, even before you said anything, because I know <laughs> what you do. Uh, uh, I will I will say that um, that uh, we, we got a lot of people sign up for this, so there's a lot of interest in what you do. And I think it's very unusual for somebody to be in a position to say, I I can I can hire an assistant if if you you know if 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 you you come up to me you know it's not I had people talk to me all the time I love to work on a show with you want to do comms with you well I usually work for another vendor or something else and I'm not in a position for that right but, right I mean a lot of people and a couple of them are, I saw that were on here have always offered they want to shadow me at times and our schedules never you know sure. click to do that yeah. and and um. You know, I'd really like to do that so I could help branch out and and so then because like I said, I never really want to give it all up. I I don't I don't have a passion for hobbies that some people do, so they can't wait to retire so they could, you know, fish the rest of their life. Or one of my friends uh, from CBS, he just wakes up in the morning and can't wait to get out to his boat. I don't have a passion for that. I like being my family and all of that, but I like to keep my hand in it. And if keeping my hand in it means that I'm just helping other people carry on with the projects and I'm just helping field them out and consult a little. I'm good with that. But right it's now okay. we have a lot to learn. Right now we are, you know, these dawn of the you know, the new horizon. It is the dawn of age. It really and, is, man. And it's like and we I, I'm learning learn. learning every day. Hard to keep up. It's a lot of hard work and it's the learning curve. We've learned so much in the last five months. You know, I had to do a thing with the people from Cisco WebEx. And right at the beginning, I said, you know, you guys have been pushing for how many years now to get us to do this internet? Well, this is your time to shine. So you better get your engineers and push. And, and this is what we're learning. And I find that fascinating. If I, it was boring, I'd say, the heck with it. Yeah, I'm, where I am, we uh, I used to work here two to three days a month doing partner meetings. But now I'm here three to five days a week because every meeting is a broadcast. There's no more, there's no more live meetings. Everything's a broadcast. Uh, at the end of June, we had done, um, I think, 1.5 million Zoom connections. Uh, we're the third biggest customer at Zoom. Um, yeah. It's an entirely different, yeah. an entirely different world, and um, I, I feel very fortunate that I had a skill set that was. I was able to cross over mm -hmm. and uh and i don't i don't think a lot of that's going to go away i i i agree i think that at least in in my situation here while all of the top management is is looking forward to getting more people back into the office and having more more face-to-face -face meetings because they believe their corporate culture is driven by that mm -hmm that it's the contact and the collaboration mm -hmm. that that they feel is their corporate culture. They also know that as top executives, they have saved a ton of time in the last three months by not flying around the world to have meetings. Mm -hmm. And they've saved a ton of money by not flying around the world to have meetings. Um, so, a lot of this is going to stay. I don't think all of it's going to stay because they really feel that the face-to-face -face contact is important. I don't think anybody will say, let's have a conference call. Nobody yeah. will say, let's have a conference call. Let's say, let's do a Zoom. Oh, we get excited yeah. now when we hear we get a regular conference call. Like, oh, great, I don't have to comb my hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
I never have to comb my hair. Well, look, I had mine buzz. I had mine buzz the other day when my sister buzzed it. And look, for those who know me well, I'm, I've let all the color out. I'm going all white. Just like I'm me. Gonna some, I'm going to do some dye like, you know, once it's all white, then I could do like Pete and just make it a different color every other day. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Maria says, thank you very much for this webinar. Very interesting and amazing listening to Gail. Cheers from Argentina. Ah, uh, thank you, Maria. Thank you. Look in Argentina. Well, we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, round wind it up now. I think it's it we we've exhausted the questions. I will say that we have a couple of really good shows coming up. If I do say so myself, Friday we're gonna uh, do with uh, Corey Peoples and Jason Waffle from uh, Shure oh, cool. are going to uh, uh, do a frequency coordination of a ma made up mega convention show that I did the coordination for on the Monday show, and we'll see how they compare. And then on Tuesday and Thursday next week, I'm going to talk about really, really basic beginner's calm, like way back two tin cans and a string. We're going to start back at the beginning. So uh, no digital stuff allowed. So we'll we'll see where all that goes. And and then I'll, and I'll be out of job. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And, and then and then we do have a whole series of of uh, uh, shows, three different shows coming up starting on July 25th, 26th, and 28th, um, with uh, the stage managers from the a uh, uh, bunch of Olympics. Uh, oh, cool! Sam Very Hunter cool. and Julia Whittle are going to talk about how they stage manage a show with uh, 10,000 participants. So that's that's going to be really exciting. And they're opening gonna ceremonies. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. So I want to thank you again very much, Gail. And well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Show. Although Fine. I don't think I'll ever see you in person anymore. It'll just be on the little screens on my computer. Right. So uh, <laughs> uh, we'll just have to live with that. That'll be the problem. Yeah, right. Right. Well, we'll get together one day soon. I hope. There we I go. Know. Yes. But anyway, okay. thank you, and hopefully I get to see Max soon too. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gail. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.